Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome and thank you so much for making it tonight for our fall and winter gardening presentation with the CSU Extension Office. Uh, we are so excited that you are here today. Um, first off, uh, we just want to uh, let everybody know that we are so excited that you're here and we hope that this is a super educational program for you. Um, but also, we would love to know where you are from. So if you don't mind just taking a quick moment, uh, there is a comment section at the bottom of this presentation. You can put your first name, last name, the year that you graduated, um, and where you are watching from today. Uh, we get alums that are all over the country, all over the world that uh, like to come in and check out these programs. So, uh, but wherever you are today, we are so excited that you are here and we thank you so much for taking the time to come out. Um, I would also like to uh, just do a quick shout out and a big thank you to all of our members of the Alumni Association. Without you, um, events like this would not be possible. Um, so thank you so much for being a member of the Alumni Association. Uh, we really appreciate everything that you do for CSU. Um, also, do not forget to check out all of our other virtual events that we've been doing throughout the pandemic, as well as uh, continuing through uh, this year. We are going to continue to keep doing uh, more and more programs uh, virtually and in person as we continue to move forward. Um, feel free to subscribe to our, our YouTube channel that I will post into the comments uh, in just a few moments. Uh, but it, if you just look up CSU Alumni Association in YouTube, you can click on the channel right there. Um, I will also, in just a few moments, post my information in the comments section. So if you are having any issues uh, on StreamYard or on YouTube, you can send me an email. I'll be watching my email or shoot me a text message on my phone. Uh, I will post my information in just a quick moment. Um, without, uh, without further ado, I would love to introduce our guest tonight. Uh, Dan Goldhammer is with the CSU Extension Office down in uh, Denver. Uh, Dan is also a CSU alum. Uh, he has his master, he got his master's in 2010 as well as in 2021. So we are so excited to have Dan here today. Uh, Dan, you can go ahead and say hi and thank you again, everybody for making it tonight. All right. Well, good evening. I'm so excited for y'all to join. And, you know, as Corey said, my name is Dan Goldhammer and I work for CSU Extension down here in Denver. And I serve both as the county director and also as uh, a horticulture educator. And tonight we'll be talking about kind of, you know, fall and wintertime horticulture. And here we go. So, First off, I just want to say thank you from CSU Extension for coming tonight. Um, if you're not familiar with Extension, you know, our really uh, mission is to really help people answer those difficult questions in their lives or the simple ones using really science-based educational resources. And we're actually in 61 out of the 64 counties here in Colorado. So chances are there's a county extension office where you live. And we provide all sorts of really great resources, not only horticulture, but youth development through 4-H and uh, family and consumer sciences and natural resources. So uh, please check us out if you have any questions. I'd also just like to say thanks to people who helped uh, create this presentation. Um, Errol Kingsbury, who is uh, the Master Gardener Coordinator in Denver, and then Eric Hammond and John Mergel, who are both uh, horticulture educators, and Eric's uh, the county director now too, out in Adams County. So um, some of the slides you'll see are from them. Here's just kind of a quick outline of what we're going to talk about tonight. You know, we'll talk about kind of how to extend that season from the fall into the winter, um, what to think about with harvesting and lawn care, talk a lot about kind of that fall cleanup that's really important to set yourself up for success in the spring. And, you know, even though it's fall and coming into winter, there's plenty of stuff we can still plant and how to do that successfully. One of the biggest things is, you know, with our fun Colorado weather, we might have a really cold night, but then it'll be beautiful for weeks on end. And so if we can really protect some of our tender plants from that first frost, we can enjoy our garden for much longer. Um, and, you know, ways to do that would be covering them with frost cloth or floating row cover or reme, you know, or even just sheets or old buckets or Tupperwares that you have from around the house. Um, the key is to really get those on before it gets cold. And, you know, if it's really wet or anything like that, make sure it dries out before um, removing them. If it's touching any of the plant leaves, it might actually kind of cause some damage. So um, don't, don't pull off anything until it's really warmed up and really dried out. 
And, you know, one of my favorite things to do is, you know, grow these cool season crops really into the fall. And then, you know, you might not be extending the growing season, but you can really extend the harvest season and really keep those plants alive to, to enjoy those fresh veggies well into the winter. Um, and, you know, looking at broccoli and kale and cabbage and Brussels sprouts, all really can benefit from that, that season extension technique of covering. And in fact, um, get a little bit sweeter after that first frost. So if you have any of those crops in your garden, do whatever you can to really keep them alive during that first couple of frosts and you'll really enjoy a lot of great harvest that tastes really great. You know, unfortunately, a lot of those, you know, beautiful summer crops that we love and enjoy, tomatoes, zucchini, things like that, um, it's gonna be really hard to protect them. Even just cooler temperatures can cause a lot of problems. And um, so with those, really, we wanna get those out of the garden um, and including trying to get much of the roots out as possible. The reason for this is we'll keep talking and coming back to this, it's all about sanitation and that both insects and plant diseases can kind of overwinter or live on that dead tissue. And so by removing it, you're kind of uh, helping set yourself up for better success next year and not having to fight problems um, throughout the year. And this is really important for kind of removing any off looking plants or weeds that might've had diseases on them. And, you know, if those are, uh, you know, things like everything from powdery mildew to any kind of the, the wilts or blights or things like that, um, it's really important to get that out because those can really kind of serve as reservoirs for next year's uh, problems. Um, and another kind of fun thing is a lot of the root crops, especially carrots, if you cover them with a nice mulch of leaves or the floating row cover, you can actually keep them in the ground, you know, well into the winter and, and pull them up when the ground's not frozen and have, you know, fresh, yummy carrots. Um, so keep those going. And, you know, the kind of mulches that really help too is that leaf mulch. You know, a lot of times we'll bag that up and either compost or to throw it away. But if you want to save some time and some energy, uh, you can just put them in your vegetable garden. And especially if you chop them up, it's a really great way to add organic matter into your soil and also protect any of your crops that you might want to try and extend the season on. And another one of my favorite things to do kind of in the uh, fall and winter time, sit back with a nice warm cup of coffee and, and look at all the beautiful seed catalogs and start planning and thinking about my garden for next year. Um, you know, it's so many beautiful pictures and you can start thinking about what went well and what didn't go so well. Um, the one thing that I would suggest for everyone, if you're gonna try and plant anything from seed, is to start thinking about that earlier rather than later and start ordering your seeds now. Uh, we've been hearing and seeing about some pretty significant delays and limitations in quality and quantity. So um, it's a good time to do that. And if you really don't know um, what you wanna do or need more resources, Extension's here for you. Um, I'm a big fan of our Grow and Give program. And so that's resources for how to both grow a lot of vegetables, but then also how to give any surplus away to your neighbors or hunger relief organizations and making sure that you're doing that in a, you know, a safe way that won't kind of pass around any uh, human pathogens, which I think we're all very aware of these days. And it's really exciting that we've just updated our Colorado Vegetable Guide. And this will really kind of help you walk through all the things you need to think about for having a successful vegetable garden. So you can check it out and all of our resources are online. And for the Grow and Give, um, you know, you can click that link, you'll be sent the PowerPoint afterwards. And it has all sorts of great resources on veggies. But not only veggies um, can really benefit from extending the season. Um, you know, you can bring in your annuals and perennials and enjoy them on the inside. Um, one thing you do want to make sure is, you know, they've been out in the wild and so they could have some uh, insect pests on them, especially white flies and aphids. So, you know, you might want to quarantine them in an area of your house that uh, doesn't have a lot of plants that they could spread to and kind of keep inspecting them, making sure you're not bringing any problems into your house. And so after two or three weeks, you'll, you'll see that they're clean. Then they can join, you know, the healthy indoor plants. Um, and also, you know, the the environment inside is so much different than outside. And so you really wanna monitor your watering. Um, you know, outside, you know, there's all this sunlight and wind and that really uh, increases the evapotranspiration of plants. And uh, when you're, they're inside, that's really decreased. So you might need to water less frequently. 
um, and then keeping them in a sunny window and away from cold drafts that'll help them you know continue to thrive and those cold drafts can actually be damaging or dehydrating. Another fun thing is you know to propagate or to take cuttings. Um, lots of annuals can really uh, benefit from this and you can have turn one plant into many. Um, these kind of outline the, the steps, but it's really trying to, you know, take a little bit of the stem um, and, uh, you know, kind of clean up the leaves, dip it in rooting hormone, which is often um, an auxin, and those come in powder and liquid forms. And then what you do is you carefully insert that uh, cutting into some sort of uh, growing media, usually perlite, sometimes sand, and then water lightly and cover. Um, and this kind of helps create that humidity. And over time, uh, what's really cool about plants is they have cells that are known as meristem, and those cells are undifferentiated. And what that means is they can turn into anything. Um, it's kind of like stem cells in the body that um, by regulating those, those ratios of hormones, um, what was once shoot tissue can turn into root tissue. And so you can just you know, keep checking on them, keep misting them, keeping sure that humidity is at a right level, not too high and not too low, and then you'll have cuttings. And um, you, know, you can plant those out and have plants ready to go for next year. Other things to be thinking about um, are dividing your spring blooming perennials. And you know, this is really important that, uh, you know, no one really likes to get crowded. Like, especially these days, you get onto a bus or go into the airport or anything like that, and you don't wanna be touching anyone. Same thing with plants, that plant spacing is really important for plants to thrive. And a lot of these perennials um, over time will just start to get crowded. And so by dividing them up, what you're doing is creating uh, space for them to thrive, and then also getting more plants that you can plant around your landscape or give to your friends and neighbors. And how you do this is, you know, just take a nice uh, clean spade, dig them up, um, and then usually like each chunk you'll take around uh, four or five divisions out of that, just kind of break it apart, and then uh, plant them back, and you should be good to go. With our annuals too, you know, a lot of the times uh, when we have that first frost, it's just time to, to kick up your heels and, and say goodbye. You know, it's a little sad, but it's also kind of a big relief sometimes for myself to be just knowing that the gardening season is over. And again, what we really wanna do is we wanna throw away or compost any plants that show issues with diseases or insects. Because again, this sanitation is so important to setting ourselves up for success in the spring. But, you know, not, all the time, we don't have to go crazy with sanitation. Um, you know, if things are really healthy looking and they're perennials, um, you, can, you can actually leave them up. And we'll talk about some of the benefits associated with that. Uh, so it's, you know, this is, we're in biology here. So there's never like a hard and fast rule. We're not, we're not an iPhone factory. So there's things to think about um, and there's always exceptions to every rule. You know, part of this is that, those, that this winter interest and if you know you cut everything down and it's all barren, you know it might not look very uh, exciting, and also can also be damaging to the ecosystem. Uh, you know, humans are part of the a part of nature, and if we kind of take away everyone's home, then uh, you know we're not quite being the same stewards that we would want to be. Um, and so, by leaving up some, especially our perennial grasses and our ornamental grasses, we can provide a lot of shelter for everything from you know rabbits and birds to uh, you know honeybees can actually. Uh, or bumblebees will will nest in ornamental grasses, and so will other kind of um, woodcutter bees or things like that. So we really want to provide that habitat or home for um, some of the the beneficial insects and animals in our landscape. You know, I really like this quote. You know, it's a, it's from a colleague out in Nebraska Extension, but it really just speaks to that beauty and that stillness of a, of a winter landscape and how um, just because nothing's growing right now or photosynthesizing, there can still be some really uh, great things to do with your landscape. You know, one thing that, um, you know, a lot of people will do is, is start pruning. And um, I, would, I would encourage everyone to just take a deep breath and not start pruning yet. Um, the problem with pruning so early in the fall and even early winter, is plants haven't really had the time to go fully dormant. And if you make cuts in your plants right now, 
they're going to try and heal up um, and they won't be completely healed before it gets really, really cold. And you're just introducing a lot of ways to stress your plants out. Um, and so, yeah, and it's going to try and push new growth and that's going to be really vulnerable to any kind of freezing temperatures and, and can cause problems, everything from, you know, dieback to oozing to cracking. So um, if you're going to prune, it's a great idea to really wait into that, uh, into the, the heart of winter or even in fact, like um, spring or early summer after that first flush of growth is all done. And that when you're thinking about pruning, um, we always recommend if you're, you're working on big trees, if you don't feel confident, you should work with a certified arborist. And uh, there's a couple of organizations that, that certify arborists, um, arborists, and you really want someone with some licensure because uh, you know these are big important plants in your landscape. And if they drop the limb on your house, um, you know that's that's really not great. And so having that kind of professional certification can help you vet uh, people than just you know a random person with a chainsaw. And kind of what you're thinking about um, when you're asking about pruning or you're trying to do it yourself is you're trying to really uh, get the tree to be happy and healthy and to look good. And part of that is the form. And what you really wanna do is think about um, kind of where branches meet the trunk and how many and when and at what angle, angle and uh, addressing that so they don't, won't break off in our high winds or with snow, especially those heavy spring snows. Um, and that, you know, again, it's not about trying to miniaturize any of your trees that might be larger uh, you know, then, or, you know, really trying to take on really large branches. That's just, you know, the, the time has gone uh, past for that. And we talk a lot about an extension, you know, the, the right plant in the right place. And maybe it's time to start thinking about alternatives to that plant. If it's really, you're just starting to battle it in a eyesore or a danger to your landscape. And then also thinking about like the function and, you know, pruning off branches that might start overgrowing your sidewalk or your back porch and or if you know it's blocking your nice view of the mountains or the sunrise or the sunset um it's all important things to think about uh and especially in like big mature landscapes if you're trying to thin out sort of the canopy to help reduce this shade uh, that might be around your tree so you can grow things underneath it And we have lots of great fact sheets, and this is just kind of an example of one that uh, can talk about really if you want to prune and do it yourself, here's the best way to do it. You know, it's not just a simple one cut process that you're going to go in there and cut uh, wherever you want. Um, and, you know, things can happen where if you're cutting and it starts to splinter and break, you're, you're causing a really big wound. Um, and that a lot of time, this figure talks about the branch collar. I think you can see my mouse. So. Uh, you want to make sure you're not cutting into that collar because that's going to really damage it, the tree's ability to heal itself and or to heal itself. Um, and so again, there's there's lots of art and science and horticulture. And here at Extension, we're really help uh, here to help you provide that unbiased information to make those great decisions for your landscape. Um, if you have beautiful rose gardens, uh, you know, things to start thinking about is reducing that watering so it's not pushing out as much growth so it starts to get those signals that it's winter time it starts to go dormant it starts to harden itself off um, and again we don't really want to cut back our roses until the spring uh, because anytime we make a cut we're just inviting kind of damage to come in from that cold and you know we also really want to think about tucking in our, our roses uh, before winter with a, a nice m amount of mulch of six to eight inches and you really want to do that around the crown. And the crown is, you know, a botanist term for where root meets shoot. So kind of right there at the base of the soil. Um, and if it's grafted, you also want to protect that grafting point. And I think if, if you take anything away from tonight, it is this one slide. Um, that our, our beautiful Colorado winters are, can be really dry. Um, and that uh, with the sunshine and the wind, it really can desiccate or dry out a lot of our plants. And so what we need to do is start thinking about um, is winter watering. And to really do that right, what you're looking for is kind of poking around and seeing um, if the top inch of that soil is wet 
or, or dry. And if that top inch is starting to get really dry, it's time to do some winter watering. And to do that, you know, you want to wait till the ground's not frozen and that temperatures are above 40 degrees. And um, you really want to do it slowly. And whether that's with a, like a soaker hose or just by hand or with a bucket, um, you really want to try and uh, add that water very slowly because, you know, the soil might be a little bit frozen and so it's not going to infiltrate it very well. Um, and another important thing to think about is, especially for our bigger trees, is you want to be really, um, you're getting all around that drip line. So you look at the edge of those branches and where they come down, that's kind of the drip line. So it's not just around the base of the trunk. And, you know, we kind of think like the general rule of thumb is, again, that 10 gallons uh, per inch of tree diameter. So, you know, if you have a really big tree, that's a lot of gallons. So just try and do as much as you can. Um, and, you know, I think really it's about, you know, you should be thinking about it every few weeks, once a month, um, if we're having a pretty dry winter. And of course, there's no need to water if we have a bunch of snow on the ground. Another thing, again, don't forget to, uh, you know, blow out your sprinkler system. So, you know, turn off the water, unhook the hoses from the house, and have your, your lawn irrigation or your landscape irrigation blown out by a professional, or if you're gonna do it at home, make sure you just have a big enough air compressor to know what you're doing. You know, my uh, first degree from CSU was in soil and crop science. So, you know, soil is, is near and dear to my heart. Um, and, you know, this is a great time to start thinking about what your landscape might need um, in terms of plant nutrition. And why this is so important is there's a, a concept of Liebig's Law of the Minimum. And uh, what, what this is saying is that, you know, there's going to be one nutrient usually that is limiting your plant growth. And that until you address that one nutrient, uh, you know, it doesn't matter if you add more nitrogen or phosphorus if, you know, boron is limiting to it because uh, it, those, those nutrients just won't be utilized because the plant's limited by that one nutrient, maybe boron. Um, the unfortunate but fortunate news is that the Soil and Water uh, Plant Testing Laboratory up on campus is moving down to Denver. So I'm really excited to have it in my backyard, uh, but uh, they're not accepting tests right now. So, uh, you know, there's some other local labs or kind of regional labs that you could look for. And um, what you really wanna make sure to do is you're staying kind of in states that neighbor us. Uh, we don't wanna, you know, if you went to Cornell or you grew up on the East Coast or you went to Davis or you grew up in California, we love those landscapes, we love those climates, um, but their soil labs aren't really adapted for our Colorado soils. And so you really wanna um, use something more regional. So we've talked a lot about cleanup, but um, you know, there's still things we can, you can go to the garden store today and um, buy some plants and get them in the ground. So I think, uh, you know, I always forget this, but every spring I'm just so happy to see all those bulbs uh, coming out and just the, the, the pop of color in the spring. Um, and so now, now's the time, the great time to think about it. It is starting to get a little bit late in the season. So if you want to plant some bulbs, do it this weekend. Um, and the reason is we really want those bulbs to start rooting and establishing themselves before the ground freezes. And again, with crazy Colorado weather and depending on where you are in the state, uh, we might have plenty of time or we might have no time. And uh, so it's also really important to uh, get those bulbs deeper. It's, it's a pretty deep planting process. And when you buy bulbs, there's probably instructions on how deep to plant them. And, and if not, we have lots of great fact sheets on, on bulb planting on our websites. Um, and again, mulching and winter watering are very important to really have that beautiful flush of growth in the spring. Uh, Dan, we have a quick question that came in. It says, uh, can you test your soil any time of the year or is there a preferred time to test it? Um, you know, there, the preferred time of year is to really test it in the spring. Uh, but unfortunately, that's when everyone else is testing their soil too. So you might run into some delays. Uh, and for my general recommendation is you, because of the, the biochemistry of nitrogen, we just kind of know that nitrogen is going to be lower most years. Um, we call it highly mobile in the ecosystem. Um, you know, it will leach out into the groundwater, it'll turn into a gas, it just doesn't stick around. Um, so if you 
get your soil tested in the fall, just kind of know that your nitrogen is going to be even lower in the spring and that you'll probably have to apply a little bit more. And, you know, if you go to the garden center right now, there's, you know, there, there might be some really great trees or woody perennials or anything like that um, on sale. And, you know, it'd be a great time to, to pick up a deal, but there's things you got to take steps um, to make sure it's, it's planted correctly um, and, and to really keep it healthy and happy over the winter. Uh, the first thing you really want to think about too is when you go to the garden center, um, looking at those, those plants and making sure that they've, they've started to go dormant and that they're starting to you know, get that hardening for winter. If it looks like something just came fresh out of a greenhouse, it's green, it's soft, it's luxurious, it has flowers, you know, this plant is like behaving as if it was still summer and that the, the rapid drop in temperature is going to, to really uh, kill it. Whereas, you know, plants that have started to get, get those uh, biotic and abiotic signals that it's, it's fall time and that it's starting to harden itself off and getting ready for winter, those are the plants that you can plant, um, you know, now and into the winter. Um, you know, planting trees is such an important process and, you know, that's a whole other lecture in itself of how to do it right. Um, we have, again, great, great resources on that. Um, and I would, I would definitely recommend everyone to check those out. Um, and then again, just remembering that winter watering is really important, especially for, you know, something that was in a pot right now and you're putting in the ground, you got to think it's still pretty much in that pot. Uh, so it, it needs uh, some that winter watering to stay happy and healthy. And here's just a, a list of some of the trees that uh, Eric really loves for kind of their fall interest. So if you're thinking about next fall and really want a beautiful pop of color, um, here's some really great uh, cultivars of, of trees. So, you know, we have the, the Caddo sugar maple, Again, kind of gets that uh, really beautiful red that, that's much rarer here in Colorado. You know, the calorie pear, again, has this beautiful red color in the fall and then beautiful blooms uh, in the spring. Uh, this, again, another maple, uh, Manzano big tooth maple. Uh, service berry, I really love service berry. Um, it has, again, has that beautiful color. It's really well adapted here to Colorado. And then uh, this oak tree again, really, really great um, for here in the fall. It has this really interesting, beautiful textured leaves that can really add um, a lot of, uh, you know, something different to your landscape that might uh, make your landscape stand out compared to your neighbors. Uh, and speaking of, you know, plants that are good all year round, um, I would really encourage everyone to check out Plant Select. And Plant Select is a partnership between CSU Extension, or CSU, um, CSU Extension, Denver Botanic Gardens, um, and the green industry here in Colorado. And, you know, these are plants that are either native or have been uh, selected for other similar, from other similar ecosystems to really thrive here in Colorado. And so, Bred, selected, um, trialed, and so these are these are proven winners for uh, what I often describe as the full contact sport of gardening here in Colorado. And then lastly, you know, taking care of our lawn. So again, um, when we're starting to think about our are those last mowings as our lawn um, starts to go dormant, um, we we want to keep it a little bit longer. In fact, in general, it's a great recommendation to kind of keep your grass a little bit longer, um, kind of in that three inch range. Um, it just uh, might seem a little bit longer than your neighbors, but there's lots of really great benefits in terms of water use efficiency and overall turf health. And again, as I say that, um, you know, there's, there's lots of variability within turf. So, uh, you know, depending if you have a bluegrass or a ryegrass or a, uh, you know, a, a, some other type of grass, there's gonna be different needs, so be great to start with understanding which your grass is and you can find identif identification guides on our website and then um, kind of adapting very specific management challenges um, especially for fertilizing again 
doing this fall fertil fertilizing really helps establish a nice healthy root system. And um, you can, you don't want to over fertilize right now because it can cause undue growth. Um, you know, it's trying to push out all this heavy growth before it goes dormant, which is not great. And can also cause increased uh, stress because of um, watering. So check out this table um, and kind of know that you're looking at um, some, some fertilizer put down. As again, looking at the top there, nitrogen application rates are in pounds of nitrogen per thousand square feet of lawn area. So, you know, I'm not sure if anyone told you there'd be math tonight, um, but to be a good horticulturalist, you're gonna have to do some math. And to really do that, you need to understand um, the three let, uh, let numbers on your fertilizer bag. And, you know, those respond to, uh, correspond to N, P, and K, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Um, and those are all expressed as a percentage. So, you know, a, this 40 pound bag, that's a 2510 is 20 pound or 20% nitrogen, 5% phosphorus and 10% potassium. Um, and the, the trick is there, uh, you know, you got to understand that, okay, I'm going to have to weigh out my fertilizer to get how many, um, pounds of nitrogen I need to apply to my yard. And so first you need to kind of know the square footage of your yard. And then um, you know, what you can do is just do the math once. And if you don't change products that have a different ratio, you can kind of weigh out, you know, one scoop or something of that and see how many pounds that is. And then just kind of know that, you know, every cup of this fertilizer weighs this many pounds. Um, and so then in the future, you can just say, okay, my lawn needs three cups in the summer, but only one or two cups in the fall. And again, winter watering, winter watering, winter watering, um, especially if you have south or west exposures, um, you really wanna, again, get out there once a month to really help, uh, you know, keep those root systems happy and healthy. The other best thing you can really do um, for your lawn is aerating. Um, and what's really important about this is it's kind of like what we talked about dividing those perennials, that when you pull uh, a plug out from that lawn, you know, you're, you're removing uh, tissue and root tissue and you're giving that lawn more time, uh, more, more space to grow into and just kind of giving it a little bit uh, more breathing room, uh, literally that it helps with oxygen infiltration. Um, and it's really, uh, really a great thing you can do. And then, you know, overseeding, uh, again, depending on if you have a warm season or a cool season lawn, uh, the timing of that, but that kind of just helps kind of keep things healthy and uh, keeps your grass looking nice and full. And the important thing about having a nice and full, healthy stand of grass is that that's really going to help outcompete a lot of the weeds and can reduce your time or money and herbicide use. And that we always want to practice something known as integrated pest management. And so that's understanding kind of what pests, whether those are weeds or insects we're dealing with and using the least invasive um, and least toxic methods first um, before we kind of go out to, to chemistry. So that's um, kind of fall gardening in a nutshell. And just wanted to let you know that, you know, CSU extension is, is here for you. Um, here's a, a link to a really great map to kind of show you where all of our offices are located all over the state. So we are um, you know, all over the state and we're here to help you answer those easy and difficult questions. Thank you so much. Um, awesome. And uh, uh, feel free to ask some questions as we're doing some questions right now for Dan. Um, and if you miss anything with the presentation, like I said, we're recording this, it's on, YouTube, it will be uh, posted on YouTube as soon as this uh, broadcast is over as well. Um, but uh, Dan, I have a couple of questions that are coming in right now, which are really great. Uh, first one is, is there a certain brand of fertilizer that you would recommend for a, a lawn? Um, not the specific brand or anything like that, but you do wanna kind of look at those numbers um, and be a savvy consumer and buy by the price per pound of usually nitrogen. And um, so, you know, if, if one bag of fertilizer is a 
201010 and another is you know a uh, 522 and then the same price buying that first bag with a higher percentage um, will give you more bang for your buck um, and then you know organic versus synthetic fertilizers um, there, there's pros and cons to each um, for those you know synthetic fertilizers they can be really dialed in in terms of they'll be slow release they'll be fast release they'll have all sorts of nutrients in them and they'll be immediately uh, plant available whereas some of the organic or most of the organic fertilizers they have to go through a, a breakdown process by the soil microbial life um, called mineralization and then then they'll become available for your plants um, but in terms of brand uh, you know nitrogen is nitrogen is nitrogen awesome um, the next one is, uh, can we do a presentation all about planting trees in the future? I would love to learn how to uh, present some tree or plant some trees in my backyard. Yeah, definitely. We can pull that out. Um, I'm not sure where uh, the question is coming from, but Allison uh, up, on, up on campus in Larimer County is, is the best tree planter I know. So she's the one we should get on for the next alumni association class. Sweet. I will, I'll write her name down so that we can look at that. Um, and just FYI, we're having questions coming in from the StreamYard um, website as well as the YouTube. So um, if I butcher a question, I apologize, um, but I will do the best as I can as far as reading these to Dan. So the next question is, uh, is it better to aerate uh, your yard in the fall rather than the spring? I mean, I think... I, I think fall is usually better, um, but I'd, I'd have to double check that and that, you know, some of our stuff I think that I recommends, you know, twice a year if you can. So um, it's just something really good that you can do for your lawn. Awesome. Uh, the next question is, can we plant any of those cold foods now and through the winter if uh, we are using season extensions? Um, it, it kind of depends on the weather, but what I would try and do would be planting spinach would be my, if, if you like spinach, I'd go for that and try and really cover it. You, what you is gonna happen is you're not gonna get any real growth. You might get a little bit of germination. And then if you protect it and keep it from dying, um, you'll have a really great jump start in the spring. Um, if you are thinking about trying to do kind of fall vegetable production, uh, you know, a couple months ago is, is really kind of that prime time to plant um, and then have it grow and keep it alive um, throughout the winter. Cool. Um, and then also another question about um, the season extensions. It says, I've tried um, the window cold frames, but have not had success too hot and bright here so far. Any success with those or just use the cloth? Um, yeah, I mean, like the the cold frames, it's it's so tricky. So basically, the larger the volume of air that you capture within kind of any season extension structure, the more temperature buffering there is. So that means like the slower, the more buffering and capacity it has, the slower it will cool down and the slower it will warm up. And since those cold frames are so small, you know, the cold they cool down and then heat up so fast. And so, yeah, you know, I've I've killed plenty of plants by basically steaming them in a cold frame because I was like, oh, you know, I'll open it up after I have my cup of coffee. And by the time I had my cup of coffee, sun's up, it's beating on it. Um, and, you know, it's gotten way too hot. Um, there are kind of automated openers um, and they work as kind of wax pistons. And so as that wax heats up, it actually expands the piston and will automatically push and vent open your cold frame. So that could be um, a nice solution to try and look at. Um, and because the problem with the, the floating row cover is, it, you know, it's porous, so it doesn't quite provide a, a lot of that protection that that glass does. So um, that's where, those are the two things I would look for, would be kind of a wax piston automatic opener and installing those and, um, and then trying, yeah, trying the floating row cover. Awesome. Um, the next question is about uh, season extensions as well. Uh, same person, they asked us to thank you for answering these questions. Um, it says also about the roots, there are many different camps about this. Um, 
if the plant was disease free, is it okay to cut down the level of the soil and leave them there in raised garden beds specifically, or should we just get rid of them all? Um, I, I, it, yeah, I, I think there it depends on kind of what plant it was. Um, but again, leaving up that winter is interest and that habitat can actually be really beneficial if the plant's not host to pathogens and uh, insects. You know, some insect pests has success, especially from the Lepidoptera. So those are kind of like you know the butterflies. Um, those uh, those can their their pupa can can overwinter on on plants. Um, and so one thing you can really do is uh, is chop everything up. So mow mow it with your lawnmower, and um, you know that might you know that won't create that beneficial habitat for some of our uh, insects and animals, but it will kind of destroy any habitat for potential pests. And by chopping it up, you're going to help it kind of decompose much quicker in the spring, and you won't have to be dealing with you know giant tomato stems or anything like that in your garden. Awesome. Um, with that, um, I don't have any other questions, so I'm going to just say a couple things. And if another question comes in, we can answer that question. But if not, uh, we can go ahead and call it good for tonight. Um, again, thank you so much, everybody, for making it. Um, if you have any questions, uh, we are going to be sending out an email after this presentation, probably on Monday or Tuesday, uh, with a survey link, as well as uh, the the PowerPoint that Dan just shared today, uh, but feel free to ask any questions and I'll be happy to forward those questions over to Dan so that he can ask them on another uh, time or date. Um, with that, like I said, I haven't gotten any more questions, so I think we're good to go, um, which means everybody gets a couple more minutes back in their day today. So thank you so much. Uh, we hope you this was uh, educational for you. And on that note, go Rams and have a great night.